The Christian Atheist is also available on YouTube, and you will find other great content, including the literature I frequently refer to, on our Simple Gifts podcast. If you find our content helpful, consider supporting us through PayPal at Romans chapter 5 at Comcast.net. Welcome to the Christian Atheist, where faith and reason fuse in the Incarnation. Episode 19, On Ethics, Part 2, Value. Last week we discussed the nature of human rationality and how it separates us, makes us unique in the animal kingdom. I would like to continue that strain of thought this week, though in a more pointed fashion. The human sense of value is unique. What is value? In nature, value is transient and reduces to that which immediately services instinct. In a very real sense, natural value is quite distinct from human value. The example we gave last episode of thirst can help us here. A dog values water when it is thirsty, but the value is used up entirely in servicing the instinct to drink. When thirst is quenched, water has no value. By contrast, human beings will go, and often have gone, to war over the value of water. Water has a value that is not used up in the service of instinct. Rather, humans value things through and across time. Value, that is, endures for human beings. It is temporally weighted, exists in all three time frames, past, present, and future. In a word, human value is rational, not purely practical, mediated, not transient and immediate. What value, for instance, has a diamond for your cat? What value a dollar bill, a sunset, a Picasso? Human beings find and place value on things that have no practical or instinctual value whatsoever. When I say that value is rational, I mean that it results from our capacity to be reflective, critical, and tendentious as we developed these terms last episode. Because we have an identity, a self that endures through time, we consider what has had value, that which at present has value, and what will or may have value for us in the future. Value is both immediate and mediated for human beings. We are animals, but not just animals. Value is the true substance of the human world, not matter. We perceive in terms of value, as in the psychological notion of an affordance. We distinguish value in our experience by being critical, separating the value from its background, which is thus negatively valued. Recognition of value is choice. Choice is the result of mediation, of negation, the ability to separate things into distinct, discrete packets of value. We can only choose when we have before us a field of values, of possibles. Possibility, remember, is the tendentious negation of the present as a project, a throwing forward of a self into a future that is open, indeterminate. A project, project, is always a pre-outlined resolution of a present dilemma. This is what tendentiousness really means. In presenting, or presenting, a situation as a problem, as a question, we have already outlined a sort of resolution that will resolve it as a possible. A future self with a solution to the present dilemma. The possible is not. That is, it has no present reality. But could be. May be. Thus we see that human rationality allows us to structure our negation. To literally make something of nothing. And to project that structured nothing into the future as to be achieved. It is our ability to divide our world into values, to rationally evaluate those values, place them into a hierarchy, 
a structure that allows for valuing one thing more highly than another, that makes choice possible. We choose what is more valuable over that which is less valuable. It is very important here to understand the nature of the hierarchy of value that is human experience. While human choice is operant in both the construction of our hierarchies of value and in their application to life in a valued universe, where very many go wrong in today's academic and hyper-rationalized understanding of our world, is the idea that choice goes all the way down. It doesn't. While we human beings are involved in choosing our values, in making decisions about what is more and less valuable, in the formation of our value hierarchies, we are not free to choose whether or not we value, or to a certain degree, what we value. We are, inherently and by nature, creatures who inhabit a valued world. We do not choose, borrowing a phrase from the bard, to value or not to value. As rational creatures, we are evaluating animals. And while our freedom of choice allows latitude in how we order our values within the hierarchy, none of us are free from so ordering them. And even our free choices of order are subject to real constraints. We are constrained, for instance, by our embodied rationality to value food and drink. I can anticipate the triumphal cry of the critic as I write this. Aha! You are wrong! People can devalue food and drink, and even kill themselves by self-deprivation, for instance on a hunger strike, or when deeply depressed. This objection, however, holds no force when carefully examined, but rather makes my case all the stronger. My claim is not that by necessity we must positively value such things as food and drink, but that we must value them, that we must see them as value-laden, how we value these things, positively or negatively within the value hierarchy, we have within our purview. But that we value them, we are constrained to do. It is value, in a very real sense, that makes our world, causes us to have a world, as rationality brings to us a self. Once again, we see how intertwined are the elements of human rationality. The self exists as a value. It is because we can separate that object, that is both subject and object in our experience, that reflective self, as possessing a special status within our hierarchy of value, that we can have a self. Our self is a value that we both acknowledge and pursue, both construct and discover. Because we are tendentious, we pursue value. It is in the hierarchical ordering of value that a whole, indeed unity itself, comes to being. The Greek term cosmos, an ordered world, is relevant here. The world is a unitary framework within which our experience can unfold. The universe, then, even as conceived by science, is not simply what we discover, but what we value. Why else spend so much time and energy to understand? It is because we value understanding that we seek it. It is because we value truth that we undertake such efforts to discern it. Value is foundational to human experience. We have no world, no self, no past, present, or future without value. Perhaps you have noticed the imagery we utilize in talking about this issue. There are two poles, one represented by human action, creation, choice, but another that centers on necessity, encounter, contingency, discovery. Value, it seems, is both human and extra-human. We find ourselves in a cosmos of value, but we also actively choose value and order it into a structure. Animals have no world, no whole of which they are parts. 
lacking the value ordering principle that constructs a complex whole from discrete value quanta, they simply live as part of the stream of experience. While we view animals as objects framed by various contexts, jungle, continent, planet, solar system, galaxy, universe, etc., animals do not. They do not live in a world, as this realization is predicated on the ability to negate the immediacy of experience, to look beyond the here and now, to posit an unexperienced, indeed unexperienceable, whole of which our immediate experience is but a part. I would argue that animals value nothing that properly understood value is restricted to human rationality. We should not anthropomorphize by attributing this valuation to animals. It is this same rational ability to separate, define, unify, characterize, and value our experience and world that enables us to become imbalanced in our understanding, however. We are both active and passive free and constrained, creative and compelled when we value our experience. If we emphasize one of these tendencies over the other, we miss the truth, either of our own responsibility for our values or in denying our constraints, thinking ourselves more powerful in relation to value than we ought. Herein lies Friedrich Nietzsche's, indeed most of the post-Hegelian traditions, greatest error the idea that we can create values. Martin Luther King Jr. said this in one of his sermons. The first principle of value that we need to rediscover is this, that all reality hinges on moral foundations. In other words, that this is a moral universe and that there are moral laws of the universe just as abiding as the physical laws. I have expressed in earlier versions of the Christian Atheist that a love for the artifacts of human intellect, the example of Narcissus, is relevant here, is perhaps the origin of humanity's greatest danger. There is an arrogance to human intellect that leads us to ideological one-sidedness. While we are free to order, and to some extent even to choose our values, this freedom is not unconstrained. As Martin Luther King put it, there exists a right and wrong in the very nature of our cosmos to which we must conform ourselves. This is the universal ought of human ethics. And it is to the origin of this ought that we turn our attention in the next edition of The Christian Atheist. Thank you for listening. I am a Christian with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass, and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening, and remember, you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian.